Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I have on someone everyone knows, Mr. Terry Keating, a.k.a. Bonzolium. Terry, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Bart. How are you? Thanks for having me. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, sure. My pleasure. Um, as I mentioned, your YouTube channel is just absolutely one of the best drum-related uh, YouTube channels out there. Obviously, it's John Bonham related. Um, you are you and George Flutus, and I'm sure a couple other guys or girls really know their stuff with Bonzo. And uh, George was just on doing his Bonham episode because you know why not have George? And uh, I'm excited to have you on today, though, to not talk about Bonham. But let me say first off, congrats on your success with YouTube, like sixty thousand subscribers. It's pretty amazing. You know, I I really appreciate that. It's funny. I I went from, you know, it takes you forever to get a thousand, then a little more forever to get like five thousand, ten thousand. But then I started to cruise pretty fast up yeah. through like the twenty five, thirty, thirty five. But then when I hit about fifty five thousand, I just got I mean, I've been sort of it took me of like three or four years to get from fifty five thousand to sixty thousand. So I don't you know, maybe I just topped out. Maybe we tapped out all the diehard Bonham Zeppelinites. I, I don't know. But, it you know, it, I'm very grateful, though. I mean, I look and I see 60,000 subscribers for a 52 year old, you know, guy making, you know, his, his bottom videos from his <laughs> from his studio in the basement. You yeah. Know? I'm yeah. Very grateful. No, I, I I don't know why it is, but I've had the same thing where, you know, early on with Instagram, it was like 10,000, 15,000, 20,000, 30,000 was a plateau. And then 50, I've been on 50. I mean, you might be at the same number for like a year when you used yeah, to just yeah. rock it. Um, yeah, but yeah. who knows? Um, so anyway, I think this will be a cool one. So like I mentioned, you were really known for this Bonham, just expert madness. You're playing. Everything is great. The channel's hysterical. Um, but we're going to talk about uh, some different stuff because you yourself are a drum collector. You have been, um, when we've talked on the phone a few times, it's very clear that you're from that generation of kind of pre-internet, obviously, um, the phone calls back and forth. A lot of guys um, like John Aldridge and um, Rob Cook have talked about on the podcast a lot of like just how it used to be. So I want to kind of have you discuss a little bit and share, you know, the way it was um, and all that good stuff. So so let's jump in here, Terry. And why don't you tell people, how did you get into collecting vintage drums of any kind well it, it, a little later than um probably uh, i wish i'd done it a little earlier because you know uh, you know back in the 80s people were giving away stuff like i had um the first drum set i ever got actually was a friend of mine uh his his drum set and he had like two rack toms that were jerry rigged to a hi-hat stand and a floor tom and a snare drum so what I used to do is I used to put a towel a la Ringo on the uh, – actually on all, all the drums, although I didn't realize Ringo did it. They were just so loud. And then I would play with my right hand. The floor tom is the bass drum and, and then the snare. So like, so my right hand would go back and forth between the floor tom and the snare. And I'm like, sure. do-da, do-do-da, while my left hand kept time yeah. on an old crutch cymbal I had. So in those days, and this would have been 1982 – um, that was a couple of years into a lot of American drummers that had all had their Rogers and Ludwig and Slingerland and Camco and, you know, these kids and were started to all like rush towards Yamaha, Pearl and Tama. So they started just liquidating. I mean, there was a paper in Chicago called the trading times and there literally used to be pages, like three or four pages of just drums. And when I say a page, I mean, you know, like, so if you're looking at it and it's open, there's two pages, yeah, right? Yeah. And there you'd see like, and at the time, I didn't even know what the hell Rogers was. I remember seeing like, God, what is Rogers? You know what I mean? Yeah. And you'd see though in these ads, I remember reading like, you know, Red Onyx Rogers with matching Dynasonic. I mean, I'm not kidding. Wow. You know, full sets of symbols, $600. You know, yeah. I mean, granted, $600 in 1982 is probably like 1400 today. But I mean- it was so what happened was is i had um decided then to get my own set so i found an ad and there was for a ludwig five piece set my brother and i went but it was an old japanese set where the cover the 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 wrap had been taken off and had been spray painted black mm. i didn't know and i didn't care yeah so i paid 350 dollars american 1982 
for oh, this hunk of shite Japanese <laughs> built kit yeah. um, that, you know, I mean, I, I got thoroughly ripped off. Yeah. But to tell you the truth, I was so grateful to get my own kit. I didn't care. I realized later that I'd gotten ripped off. So what happened was as a few years went by and when I went off to college, um, I, you know, I decided I'm like, you know, this, I really would like a different set of drums. So I just looked. Uh, I was at the store and I was kind of looking around real fast and I saw, you know, uh, you know, in those days, you know, to, like nowadays you have all the companies that there's like, uh, like eight or six to eight, almost like levels, maybe not that many, but four or five sure. or line, then the kind of lower and then the medium sort of lower and then better than that, better than that top of the line and then thorough deluxe. You yeah. know, in those days, a lot of the companies just had, you know, like with Ludwig, they just had the, you know, the standards and then the regular, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and Ludwig got on board with the whole, uh, you know, middle lines, you know, the Epic and the Element, all that stuff, a, a, a good almost 15 years later than the other companies mm. did. But um, anyway, so I bought this kit and then I wanted another kit. So I saw a used set of um, uh, Pearl Exports, which I just bought. And, you know, those things could take a beat. And, you know, in those days they had, you know, these drums were very solid. And, and then I what had happened was I was watching. I can't remember what it was. I was watching. um Ziggy Marley, uh, but I saw somebody playing an old green sparkle Ludwig kit. And I remember thinking to myself, like, God, you know, wow, you know, that's that's Bonham. -y. Like, I love Bonham and everything. I was a huge Zeppelin fan, sure. but it, I never really went down. You know, the the big drum kits and stuff. I never really, you know, I, uh, un unbelievably, maybe at that time, I really kind of didn't care so much about it. So I thought to myself, I'm like, you know, I'm going to get myself a nice old Ludwig kit. You know what I mean? So. I found this kid on trading times and this would have been 1992 maybe. Um, and there was this lady on there. Her name was Josephine Alangi and her husband had passed away about 20 years before and he had, and she just got around. It took her that long to get around to actually selling his drums. And it was a 22, 13, 16. And I've said in another interview that it was a blue oyster pearl, but it was actually a sky blue. Hmm. Um, and it was in it was in really nice shape, and it was about 1965 ish. The serial number was about you know 220 XXX, you know, and um, it came with the a, a, a superphonic, a 514 superphonic. The hats were um, 15 inch, um, like six like late 50s, early 60s zillions. The, there was a crash that was a 17 inch. What you know, of course, turned out to be a trans stamp. Yeah, you sure. know, in those days, nobody really talked about it like that. And then this ride was a Formula 602 um, medium ride. So I got those, and they were wonderful, and they were so solid, and they sounded so good, and I left the original heads on them. So I, I got that gave me sort of the bit by the the vintage bug. Yeah, I mean that's a good first purchase there, and, and it was. Sounds like a smooth transaction where if you're maybe if your first, you know, purchase, you got first big purchase, you got kind of screwed over. That might have affected you. But that sounds like a very nice, you know, well, it's a nice little payback uh, almost a decade later. Yeah, in fact, totally. a decade later. And the funny thing was the 350 was the figure on that kit in 82. I bought the used Pearl Experts for 350 hmm. and then I bought this Ludwig kit for 350 That's what she was wow. asking. But I sent her some money when I got I told her I was going to send her some money because I didn't. You know, I, she was just a sweet lady, and I sure. was just like, you know, I mean, I just knew, even though I wasn't, um, you know, I, I wasn't familiar. You know, what happens is John Aldridge used to publish, you know, he had the Not So Modern Drummer, and there'd be buy and sell ads there. Mm -hmm. There was another fella back in those days named Larry Levy, really, really nice guy. He used to publish something called The Sheet, which was like a buy and sell paper that you'd subscribe to, and he'd mail you like once a month a letter of what people are looking for or what they're selling. And, um, but I just knew even, you know, 1992, I thought to myself, like, well, I was, if I was going to buy a brand new kit in those days, it would be at least, you know, so I just sent her another $300. That's nice. Um, and you know, and she, I wish I could have sent her more at the time I was still in college and stuff. And yeah, but anyway, so not long after that, I got, I found a, um, a red sparkle club date and that was really, really cool. And then I found, and I just went on from there. Then I found like a blue oyster pearl. And then I found, you know, I found a couple, you know, over the years, I found a couple black oyster kits and stuff. Um, but yeah. you know, in those days it was kind of, it was hit or miss and it was really exciting and it would be, you'd have a lot of highs and a lot of lows. Like, you know, you'd call, you, you'd see an ad in the paper, like, you know, an old drum set for sale, like trading times, or, you know, sometimes then you'd look in, you know, uh, more established sort of like newspapers where sometimes you'd see somebody selling a kit, yeah. um, you know, and, and you'd be so promising. It would say like uh, black Pearl Ludwig drum set with old symbols and you, you know you'd call and they'd say yeah i got them and you would do your best to have them described to you 
you know, they'd be like, yeah, it's pearly looking. And the front head says Ludwig. And you're like, yeah, you know, you think you're in business, you race out there. And it's like a, like a TKO drum set <laughs> yeah. with an old Ludwig head on the front, you know, and you just drove an hour and a half to yeah. get there. Which that's, I mean, obviously we're going to talk about how the internet changed things, but that's the, now you have photos and you can save that trip, which I mean, that's obviously a, a benefit of it. But I mean, clearly the internet changed things as far as like, you know, going to a pawn shop and getting lucky or like going somewhere because everyone has the internet. I mean, that's true with any used stuff you buy where maybe they didn't know. And a sweet old lady is one thing, but sometimes, you know, it's not a bad thing if someone, you know, just like a normal middle aged guy is selling a drum set and maybe doesn't know what he have and you get a great deal. Yeah, yeah. Nothing wrong with that, you know? <laughs> well, it's funny, you know, George Flutus just the other day found something on Facebook. Or was it Instagram? I think it was Instagram. Um, where somebody was selling a little kid's drum set and he clicked on it and it was a small bop set, I think a Gretsch kit. And and the snare definitely was a progressive jazz, mm. uh, four by four, three and a half or four by 14 for like 150 bucks wow. for the whole thing. So you'll still see that kind of stuff, you yeah. know, but you know, the internet has made the market so much more efficient. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if the stuff moves fast, you know, you really, people see those pictures, everybody and their brother and sister and they, you know, they're, everybody's an expert kind of now. So there's a lot of people scouring for it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, one thing I will say this, and this is something that has always been the case. It was the case back in the mid 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, the 15s. There's something about the state of Wisconsin. Hmm. where there's still to this day 2022 still old ludwig kids coming out like i the advice i would give a lot of people is always check the wisconsin music arounds hmm. uh it's just crazy how stuff still just shows up there it's just just out of the woodwork you that's know interesting I mean? do you think that's the proximity to chicago like closeness well, yeah. or well, well the funny thing is is i just think that um I don't know. It could be a bunch of things and something is silly or not silly. I mean, this might sound, you know, I mean, uh, you know, maybe there were just a lot of, you know, I don't know, like maybe German folk that were like, well, if I'm going to get myself a set of Ludwigs are going to be Ludwigs. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. I, don't, I don't, I don't know, you know? Yeah. That's interesting. Well, growing up, you'd never really see Rogers or, or, you know, not that often Gretsch here. You know, they were from, you know, Brooklyn or wherever they were from and New York. And but you'd see just Ludwig all over the place. And mm. uh, and still to this day, I'm telling you, Wisconsin is just crazy. You know, they had Faust music up there in Milwaukee for a long time. And yeah, that's an interesting point, too, of, of um, you know, this is kind of a it's the the theme of this episode is just collecting. And I think that applies to like like tips and tricks, too, where I know that in my experience of, uh, you know, albeit buying drums or whatever you're looking for, um, just searching outside of your main, your 25 mile radius that you can yeah, select right, right, right. on things. I mean, that's a really important thing of, of maybe, you know, the next guy is not doing that. Maybe they're just looking, you know, well, you know, here's a couple things and, and, and it's getting less and less. So now, because a lot of the people now, like your 70 year old person now, um, was 50 sort of when the internet came around. So they kind of know the internet, you know? Yeah. Um, but I would say the best advice I could give to people who really want to collect, I mean, whether they want to make money or they just want to get cool stuff is, you know, there are still some times you go to restaurants and you'll see like, um, they'll have to be selling like a, you know, like the big city papers, but mm -hmm. then they'll also have like these little teeny regional, um, ad papers still yeah you know and i would say spend 30 bucks or 50 bucks and just type in you know old drummer looking for old drums you sure. know what i mean because there's still a lot of older folks that's where they're gonna see that and they'll call you yeah you know and, and you know granted they might not have a phone to send you a picture so there still might be some of that well it's kind of pearloid looking and yeah. looks really old you know it might be old school still but you know there's still you know you might you know you could conceivably you know, you never know. There might be a 75-year-old lady that, you know, their son back in the day was a huge Zeppelin fan and bought the huge Amber kit. And, yeah. and it's been in the basement ever since. Yeah. Yeah. You or know? it's a Gladstone snare or something. <laughs> oh, or, yeah. or No, totally. I mean, yeah. And, and that has happened. I mean, I, I remember um, I never really got, you know, the best deals I guess I ever got. Um, I did over the years find a couple of the uh, Oyster Black Pearl, you know, the Ringo snares. Yep. 
um, which was kind of cool. But the funny thing was, is even this day, you know, the Oyster Black, it goes for so much money. But back in the day, there were a lot of people that got Oyster Black Pearl kits because of Ringo. Yeah, they made a ton of them. Yeah, uh, yeah I don't know what the heck ever happened to all of them. Or, yeah, I mean, my friend, I had a, uh, uh, a friend growing up, Tim. His dad owned Arlington Park Racetrack. He used to manage Madison Square Garden. And they and Tim was like the second youngest in the family. And, you know, but his older brothers were all like 20 years. You know, there was probably the oldest one was 20 years older than him, a classic baby boom kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And they had uh, a 2012-14. I think it was a 2012-14. I guess it could have been a 22-13-16. Granted, at the time, I was 10 years old, you know. Yeah. But and it it did not have a matching snare. It had a superphonic. But I mean, there there was a kit and it had the old Zildjian's and you know. So I just don't know what happened to all the oyster black. Yeah, that's come up on the podcast before about it's just the the amount you hear. It's kind of contradictory to hearing the stories about running seven days a week, all twenty four hours a day, pumping these drums out, and then now they're not. You'd think they'd be everywhere and i know uh, i mean it's it's a you know, car comparison but like like the the old i think it was it would be the model t where they made millions of them and they're yeah, just not right. as collectible because there there's so many out there but it's not yeah it's hard to find those those ludwigs well it's you know it's funny i i've never really had uh uh, uh, like a great huge crazy find you know what yeah. i mean like a gladstone or you yeah. know i mean i i'm a familiar you know who you should interview if you get a chance is randy rainwater do you know randy rainwater? yeah randy and i are talking and we're hopefully going to do one i think his i the topic we were going to do for him is exotic finishes and uh different wraps over the years um well, as yeah, kind of a yeah specific topic but yeah randy's we've met a few times at the drum shows good you could get a couple stories out of him sure i'm sure where he found you know again a lot of the times when people would find those old bop sets the ad would almost invariably read child's drum set you know what i mean because yes. it had the little 18 inch bass drum yeah. i mean i i found one or two of those over the years you know yeah um but yeah i mean the collecting it, it really is a thrill and, and again i still think that you know, again, I can't I can't stress enough that I would really try. I'm sure it might cost you 50, 100 bucks, but put an ad in the paper uh, that somebody older might see and give them a good price for it. I mean, sure. I, I you know, I you know, you could still I mean, the way I mean, now, I mean, kids go for some pretty you know good money now. You know, yeah. um, when I first got into it, you know, the 70s wasn't really collectible at all. You know, but it was always it was all 60s and before with Ludwig and stuff, you know. Yeah. So if you had like a blue and olive drum, it was kind of like, yeah, all right, well, what do you want for it? Yeah. All right. I guess I'll take that's how it was, you know. Sure. Um, because, well, you know, I, I mean, it, 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 it obviously like that's like us looking at one from like the 2010s and it's or the 2000s and it's it just well that, keeps shifting. We and that's exactly it and i think to myself like if i think back to 1992 when i got in it that's 30 years ago yeah and that's like going back from you know from 1962 from 92 yeah you know so i mean i um you know the stuff that i guess we were buying we could buy at the store in 1992 now i guess is collect i'm not sure how the younger folks you know view like 1990s and and 2000s drums do, are, do you are i you don't familiar? really know um i would say that there 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 is people who who of course want that stuff and appreciate it for what it is but there's something yeah. that's different to me about and maybe it'll change but like the mystique of a 60s or 70s drum versus the 90s even i mean me being born in 90 i'm 31 i have a kid and yeah. another one on the way like i'm an adult but i still feel even saying 1990 you know if i'm like buying beer or something it's like how old are you that still feels young for some odd reason like that saying yeah. 19 does that make sense like if you get a 90s oh. drum it just doesn't it's 30 well, years well, old it, but well it does you know one thing that happened and this is very important and i used to think about this when, when i was little you know like my older brothers and you know like older my my oldest sister or, or you know my friends older brothers and sisters that were pretty much older you know you'd see their pictures from grade school which was just six or seven years before and they'd be black and white <laughs> yes exactly so so there huge strides came in like the 80s and 90s with like photographs and yeah. stuff and you know and then digital photo photography has been around for a while now so the medium itself it's harder to date stuff now by pictures and just the, like totally like like nowadays if i'm watching a documentary and they show well here's a clip from 1978 you can just tell how it looks yeah the video quality or the but really once the 90s rolled around the mediums i think of, of the ways the images how they were collected whether it was film or video or um 
uh, you know, still film or, yeah. or, or you know, it it ju- it doesn't look dated anymore. No, you got to look I mean? for keys of like uh, like cars or things like that around it that kind of put a date. It, well, exactly. Like, you know, here's a good example. Where you can kind of see it in action. The Michael Jordan documentary that came out. And the film and the video that they used at the time when they were sort of around and working out and stuff, it looks just as crystal clear as the stuff today. Yeah. But when you watch the games, there were there were even you watch the games, you can kind of tell because it has the old school sort of score thing yeah. and the clock, you know, it's different. It dates it a little. But there was even stuff in that documentary where to me it looked like they made it a little more grainy to make it seem almost to simulate sure. what it would have been like in the seventies. Yeah. Know? No, absolutely. And, um, um, you know. Yeah, but I would going back to the drum thing, I would say that, you know, but what's I think quality is quality. And maybe it was like, I don't know, you would know more than me, but like 60s and 70s, they were still sort of figuring it out. And it had that like, oh, they're, you know, uh, they're grabbing, you know, nuts and bolts out of a bucket and you never know what era it was going to be from. It was a little more like figuring it out from all the drum companies where things, I guess, like exactly like you're saying, it's just more like uh, streamlined and figured out and less. um, uh differences drum to drum in more modern you know in the last 30 years yeah you know and 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 i do know that i guess in modern times you know there there might be there's still a lot of people today and you had it back in the 90s and or 2000s too but like all the old tama you know superstar and imperial star 70s into the 80s stuff and then the old old original like yamaha like eight and nine thousand series stuff i mean that stuff it's not american made you know you saw yeah. a lot of people are like well the american drums are the ones i want but you know there you have your uh, contingents of people that love the yamaha and the old tama imperial stars and and yeah. uh you know, the, the, even to an extent, I had a couple people with the Bonzolian thing email me like the old uh, Pearl DLX stuff. And yeah, but there really is something about, you know, once like the 1980 rolled around, you know, those old Pearl finishes were viewed as so passe. You just didn't see them for a good almost 10 or 12 years again till the early 90s. You know what I mean? Yeah. Till kind of vintage started sort of coming back in, you know, the drum shows in the 90s and stuff. Um yeah. I mean, I would also say that like one thing and and I, I've actually spoken to a few people online who like are uh, obvious big drum enthusiasts sizes like they they like large kits with huge power toms. So every category has people who 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 really like it. So you never want to say yeah. like, oh, those are no one likes those or no like there's there's, you know, buckets of people who like all the stuff that being said it seems like that's maybe not quite as collectible to your average everyday. Oh, I like this vintage drum set, giant double bass drum, four up, two down toms, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, it seems like a nice little compact Ludwig set is possibly more collectible uh, today than a big old drum set. Well, there's a couple things that happen, you know, had just like with cars, you know, automobiles, in the 60s and 70s you know these these foreign companies like the japanese companies they studied there was there was an american engineer who 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 god what was his name but he sort of wrote a book on kind of how it was sort of became became lacking in a lot of american you know industry where you know designs kind of, everyone sort of got lazy in america and mm-hmm. and and he wrote these books on how things should be and how how the quality should be you know back and god i can't think of his name but it's like a lot of you know a lot of it's like a lot of the folks in other countries really studied up on that and then you had you know japanese building this real quality stuff yeah that looked a little simpler but it, you, you could weld the hood shut and get fifty thousand miles out of it without yeah. an oil change you know that that same concept again like i mentioned before happened with drums too like in the mid you know late 70s and the 80s you know, yamaha pearl tama um sure so you know it's it's a different kind of thing like it, you know, you also have, you know, now I know with younger kids, you know, like old, like, like, like 80s metal, mm-hmm. you know, get popular, you know, like, um, you know, Judas Priest and, yeah. you know, Iron Maiden. And, and, yeah. Right. And the drum kits, you know, Nico McBrain, and these guys had, you know, like these, you know, uh, you know, tw- you, you know, and that's the thing, you know, I remember the in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, what happened was is you had. Uh, 14 inch deep bass drums was the norm and then 16 inch deep bass drums was considered power or rock mm. 
And then 16 became the norm. And then 18 was the power and the rock. And then 18 <laughs> became the norm in the past 10, 15 years. Yeah, really. And 22 was power, you know. But now we're seeing return back to 14. Um, you know, I don't know. It, it's th There really was such a social change, though, you know, through the late 60s into the 70s. And that y y there was such a, a, a really a change between a 1980 drum set you'd buy and then a 1970 drum set you'd buy, yeah. at least as far as Ludwig was concerned, you know. Yeah. Um, although I will say this one interesting thing about Slingerland, you know, I was talking about I made that video the other day about how, you know, Jason Bonham on Instagram confirmed in, in somebody's post that that Slingerland kit that, f f uh, you know, the three piece 22, 13, 16 was in fact blue sparkle. Yeah. And not green sparkle or whatever. All those pictures were black and white. But, you know, Slingerland, um, you know, actually much later than like, you know, Rogers and Ludwig sort of went from, you know, they pulled the re-rings out of the drums, you know, and they made the shells thicker. But, you know, Slingerland actually till much later actually offered both. You can still get, you know, the five ply without rings. You could still get the three ply with rings almost up until, if I'm not mistaken, 1980. Um you yeah. know, I have a catalog or two that, that you know, shows that. Um, but, yeah, you know, I'm sure there's a bunch of kids today that would, you know, you know, like those, you know, like the sonar kit, you know, get like a sonar phonic or, you know, sonar light or something, you know, partially because of the metal thing. But also, too, you know, to them, you know, that is something from when before they were born and it's pretty cool. You know, yeah. so, stuff yeah. gets trendy. But, you know, the Internet, we really can't underestimate the Internet because back prior to the Internet, people, as they got older, got dated a lot faster. Do you know what mm. I mean? Like the older mm. people now, we look at the Internet, we can see what's popular now with younger people. You can see if you like it or not. Sure. You know what I mean? And that's true with older people looking or younger people looking at older people and seeing, you know, so there's like a, an efficiency and a homogeneity homogenization yeah. to, to <laughs> sure. a lot of things now. that might the internet in other words the internet might have changed that whole fundamental way that younger people look at old stuff and older people look at new stuff you know what i mean yeah but yeah so so i you know uh, but still i the, the best advice uh, and i can't stress this enough is for younger collectors if they're still into that 30s 40s 50s 60s 70s stuff wisconsin is 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 your target you know what yeah. i mean wisconsin no, minnesota it just seems like that stuff still is coming out of the woodwork. Yeah, um, which is a, which is really interesting. I'm sure other people might have some pockets of uh, little towns near them too. But um, another question here, and I kind of alluded it to it before, is and it's this stuff isn't free. It's not cheap. You know, I talk to a lot of collectors, and sometimes I don't think it gets mentioned about. You know, I mean, a lot of us are just unless you're very very wealthy, it costs a lot of money to collect drums. Now, do you come from the camp of like you buy one and then you sell one and get a nicer one and you kind of jump up and and are they like, uh, would you view drum collecting as like um, investing in a way where you know that at some point, okay, I can get some money out of this? Well, well, it's funny, especially because in absolute terms, you know, how, you know, the prices have gone up and they're going to go up a lot more now because we're seeing some inflation. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was just looking at, you know, that inflation hasn't been running as hot as this since like 1982. And I remember growing up, I was a kid in the 70s and I saw firsthand kind of the inflation we had through the 70s. Yeah. When I, you know, when I first used to buy candy bars at 7-Eleven or whatever, they were 10 cents. And then like a year or two later, they went to 12 cents. And a year or two later, they went to 15 cents. And a year or two later, they went to 18 cents. And a year or two later, they went to 22. Yeah. It's like seven years later, you saw almost like an 80% increase. I mean, that's, so we're starting to see that again. Yeah. Um, you know, so for me, drums were never, the money was an extra kind of a kick for me. I always had jobs in those days when I'd be doing it. Yeah. But in those days, it was really like the thrill of the chase. And what had happened is you'd get the set. It would come with stands and symbols. You'd be able to sell the symbols locally. And in the end, it was almost like you like you might sell just the drum shells, you know, meaning the, the drums for what you paid a little more. But then you had all these stands and you had all these symbols. So in a certain way, it kind of grows itself. Do yeah. you know what I mean? So with the 30% you made in the kit or the 40% on your turnover, you then just put into more drums and put into more drums. So they sort of just grow. And I'm sure yeah. that's how Rand. Andy did it and a lot of these guys back in the day when the relative prices were a lot cheaper compared but yeah no there are a lot of people now that do you know view you know the stuff is super collectible like old k's i mean you know 20 years ago and they're still popular they're still very expensive but old k's got like super hot you know what i mean yeah 
I remember this guy in Staten Island, is K Symbol Stasher. I can't think of his name, but he must have, that was his eBay handle, K Symbol Stasher. <laughs> he, I mean, he was loading up on these Ks. You know, um, Ks have been, from an investment standpoint, still always pretty hot. You know, in the, um, in the mid aughts, you know, 2004, you know, 2002, three, four, five, six, you know, there was a time when old A's got real, real hot mm-hmm. and they're kind of coming back up a little bit, but I mean, there'd be times, you know, you could get like, in those days, one of the last glory years for me that I thought was great was eBay sort of first started. I was familiar enough with the old Avita Zildjian that I could just tell from photographs whether it was an older symbol or not, even mm-hmm. a relatively shitey. So there was a period of time I'd be buying like a symbol for 140 and I might sell for like three, 350 or 400. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, um, but yeah, there are a lot of people that view it, you know, monetarily. There's a lot of people that view it just as a collector would. It's just nice to know, like, like they can talk to their friends and be like, I still have that, you know, black onyx, you know, 2012, 14, you know? Yeah. It's worth noting too, that there's, um, I would say from just looking at, you know, forums and stuff that it can be frowned upon for people who buy, and sell like like not as your business I, I should say that's how drum shops work we all know that that's like there's people who wear that as their they got to keep the lights on i mean that's people forget that you yeah, know they yeah they, they, but they, they, the know? individuals who and, and i actually did it briefly um kind of out of college i was teaching drums uh or in college i was teaching drums just for some extra money and i would nice. also buy and sell um drums off of like uh, overstock websites or like those Amazon, you know. Oh, listen, I remember those. I oh my god, remember when the premier, the Janistas, the the two thousands made Janistas? They were giving them away around two thousand ten, two thousand twelve. Yeah, I got a set of Janistas, and it, it was orange sparkle. I think, I think it was a Janista. Yeah, and, yeah, and that was the lacquer. That wasn't a wrap. That was yeah, a spray on finish. Beautiful, it was beautiful. It had yeah, the dude. kicker though is it had a giant. I shouldn't say giant. It had a crack running around the floor tom maybe six inches long not really noticeable but i was buying them and selling them just to make i bought it for 200 because when you're buying them they're sight unseen basically the funny thing about the premier janistas when they made that last run is they made them you could get them in maple and birch Hmm. you know the original janistas were all birch but there were a couple problems with them and that's why they sort of fizzled i know it had to do with the dealers they couldn't really get distribution but in a lot of those you know janistas in fact almost all you know little things like the um the grommets and the drums were loose Hmm. do you know what i mean yeah like they'd rattle you know what i mean which drives you um, insane (laughs) <laughs> and those finishes, especially that orange one you're talking about, the orange gold, cracked a lot. That explains um, that, it. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, because the orange ones I had, it was the same thing. Um, but they were beautiful. They were heavy. You know, they, they were, but, you know, they were being given away by Music 1, 2, 3 and, and, you know, and Amazon. But Amazon also, too, for a while when they, um, you know, Pearl had the visions. There was a period of time a few years ago where they were given these visions away and not a lot of people knew it, but some of the visions kits that would go down, you know, they had that algorithm or whatever the heck it was yeah. that they'd be like, you know, 880. And then three weeks later, they'd be 810 and three weeks later, it'd be 760. And eventually, if you weren't really paying attention, I remember logging on. God, this is probably about eight or nine years ago. I got two pearl uh, visions kits in black sparkle with the hardware pack i got two of them for like 550 wow. one was like 280 and one was like 310 they were both 22 um 10 12 16s with the pearl sensitone those pearl sensitones were nice beefy drums they sure. ate log they came with the you know and you pick those things up for nothing you know and then you'd sell the hardware pack online for what you paid for the drums plus and then you had for free a 22 you know 10 12 16 with a snare you'd sell at somebody for christmas for like 300 bucks you know so you it, it, yeah it's fun it's kind of, it's a cool feeling you get you know i mean it's not it's just a neat feeling you know everybody loves that feeling of you know you show me one person if they weren't walking down the street and uh, and they, there was a gold nugget they'd, they'd be like yeah you know what i mean it's just a feeling you get you know yeah, um totally yeah, i mean but you know but you see it you know, now on e- on eBay, you see these sellers. I won't say who they are, but I mean, you see them. There's like, well, maybe there's more now, but there used to be a couple. And now what they do is, that, you know, they're selling like a screw for like $40. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, 
you know, and I, and I've, you know, and it, it puts you in a little bit of a dilemma. Just very recently, years ago, I had a sonar kit, which was aqua satin flame that had the, you know, the metric, you know, slotted rods. And I just thought for myself, I'm going to sell these, but, you know, I just thought, you know, um, you know, there's going to be people, these might not sell because not a lot of people are going to see that rod and be like, wait a minute. You know, in those days, it was before the internet. So if you lost your slotted drum key, you might be screwed. You might think, well, I have to tune these drums with a screwdriver. I just don't want them. Yeah. So I switched out the uh, inserts to American, you know, just regular standard. And I bought, you know, regular keyed tension rods. And, um, but I had left over, you know, I, over the years, I realized I had those tension rods, the sonar, and I sold them, but I had the nuts that went inside those, um, uh, those, uh, teardrop sonar kits. And I just kept the nuts. I just put it in a Ziploc and forgot about it. And, you know, just like two months ago, I looked and I saw there was a seller on there selling these nuts for $24 a piece. Wow. And he sold them. He sold a couple of them, you know? So I was like, well, wait a minute, you know, so I actually put on the bag of 40, the bag of 40. I put it on for 200 bucks. And to a lot of people, they might see it and be like, hey, man, you're greedy. But, you know, you never know. If I put the bag on for 40 bucks, there might have been 20 people that bought it yeah. for 40 bucks and went and sold them for 20 bucks a piece. And I'd be an idiot. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So sometimes you just don't know. You don't want to get burned. You know, you can put it on eBay. And if somebody doesn't buy it, you can lower the price. You can lower the price, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, it's come up a lot on the show, but, you know ebay craigslist facebook all this stuff it's still you and it's all sort of a pretty small community where i know really guys in your circle too i've, I've a lot of them i've talked to they'll 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 know when someone's not doing something right on ebay yeah, yeah. <laughs> like and you said i can name a few of them people know that and you know you want to be you want to you got to make a little bit of money and um i just found like I had a motorcycle years ago. It was a Suzuki TS250, which people can Google it. It's awesome looking motorcycle. I never had it running right, but I bought a gas cap and the gas cap uh, was $50 and it didn't even fit right. So, but I just found it the other day and I'm like, oh, I got to resell this, but that's exactly. not that easy. Like that takes right. work to like take a picture, upload it. Like you're looking at like a half hour just to like do all this. Well, so, it's, well, you know, what the you know what the thing is, Bart, I got to tell you is it's so much easier now because of the f cameras that are, are in our phones. Absolutely. You're right. You know, th through the early, mid, late 2000s and into the teens, in those days, you had to have a camera yep. and you'd take them and then you'd upload them. And, you know, now it's so easy just with the, with the mm -hmm. phones. Um, Absolutely right. But I know what you mean. But then there's also, too, you know, eBay's fees and PayPal, you know, all those fees have gotten real high. Yeah. Um, you yeah. know, I was just talking to George about this the other day, you know, you sell a, a drum for 300 bucks and suddenly you realize that, that what you netted after eBay and all the fees, and everything's like 218 <laughs> and you're kind of like, wait, what the hell happened? Yeah. And you had to box, you took the time to box it up. You bought the box, you sent it off. And then you have sellers that they're so used to Amazon. They're like, you know, like they're like $20 for a snare drum. Like they think they should, you know, free shipping. Like they got on Amazon yes. and stuff all the time, you know? Yeah. And it gets old, you know, it, it's just, I, I mean, I just used eBay, eBay this last time to just really sort of liquidate a lot of stuff I had here in the basement. Um, I just felt over reverb and over uh, these the, sure. the eBay was probably the best way to go, even though the fees were high. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people that do see it as a business and they just, you know, they they, you know, they sell these little parts, you know, and you uh, raised something with shipping where I, you know, because I think that's a part of collecting and buying and selling. And, and if man, I have gotten burned on shipping where. Oh, my God. Like, I remember. So quick story. I this isn't really collecting. It's more finding and selling so i've been in a in an old warehouse building downtown for years since like 2013 just with some friends we have a music space in there and there's no heat there's no ac it's freezing but it's it's a cool spot there's always random stuff out in the halls and one time i found a complete pearl uh drum set i don't think it had any hardware but i was like it's kind of the lay of the the law of the building where if it sits there for i think i waited a month and no one it just was there someone liquid someone cleared out of a room uh, they didn't take it. The landlord put it in the hall, whatever. Great. So I took yeah, it, right. which I think is fine. You know, a month. Yeah. Okay. No one's, no one's getting it. Anyway, I put it up online. I sold it for like a hundred bucks, which is great. But I think like, uh, the universe was like, you're not supposed to be doing this. You're not supposed to find something for free and then sell it for a hundred bucks. Cause I screwed up the shipping 
the shipping ended up being like eighty dollars. Oh, I've been there, and I literally lost ten dollars uh, because I did this. So it's just like, be careful with shipping. I mean, do you have any tips on how to like properly? Well, I, I know the region can- oftentimes, especially with the post office and even with FedEx and UPS. Like what I what I like to do is I like to put fixed shipping. You know what I mean? Okay. And then, so what happens is it might be twenty dollars, and if somebody in Indianapolis buys it, you're gonna you're gonna send it for sixteen, so you make four bucks. Yeah. Somebody in in Las Vegas buys it, you're gonna lose four bucks. So you kind of have that. There were a lot of times in the past when when I first kind of got back on eBay and was selling stuff, I I, I put free shipping, and of course the, everybody that was was buying the stuff through with free shipping lived on like an island <laughs> off the off the coast of Seattle, yeah. and it was like half the pr- it was terrible i was yeah. so I, had, I put like a pause like screw that so yeah that that can really toast you you know what that really boils down to just your experience you know the like the u.s post office is really good for small stuff yeah you know what i mean yeah uh, ups and fedex sometimes you know for whatever reason if you're selling stuff on ebay they give you the two options you know sometimes fedex will be cheaper by by five or six bucks and sometimes ups will be cheaper you know yeah um yeah, I mean, no, I've been there. That that has happened. You know, sometimes too, especially like when I was selling recently on eBay. You know, somebody from a, a, I didn't really list. I didn't say the in these times no foreign buyers and sellers. Sure. Uh, eBay has a thing now called the Global Shipping Program, which is cool. So you can ship it to these little like uh, in like Erlang or Kentucky for the price you'd send it. You know, to a regular person. Then somehow they eBay works it out where they ship it from this main center overseas. Hmm. But I had a couple of people buy it. You know, and they'd be like, yeah, great. You know, let me know what shipping is. And I'm like, well, you know, shipping is going to be, you know, for the snare, I'm like $95. Oh, I don't want it. So then I'm like, I got to yeah. go and I got to cancel the freaking thing. And, you know, and you lose some money doing that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because and time, so, time is money. There's no denying that. Like where once or twice, it's fine. But again, if you're like doing that all the time and measuring and, and, and weighing it and taking it and checking it. it's Well, yeah. yeah, that well, that's the thing that I, you know, again, I, I, I think, um, you know, I'm I'm grateful to kind of be getting as I get older, I'm getting out. I'm certainly not doing the, the buy it, sell it stuff anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, from time to time, if something, you know, there, sometimes something will will drop on your lap. You know, there are sometimes you'll come across something and it's been a while since that's happened. I remember, you know, if several years ago I went into Guitar Center and this was before you know, like now your guitar centers and your musical rounds, they know what the stuff is worth yeah. because we have the efficiency of the computers. You know what I mean? We have we have the Internet. And everybody can get, you know, the market you know, it reaches these these uh, efficient values very quickly because of arbitrage. You know what I mean? If yeah. somebody sees, you know, a 60, six and a half by 14 superphonic for four hundred dollars, they're going to buy it. And they're going to go and they're going to immediately turn around, and try to get twelve hundred or fifteen hundred for it. Yeah. And so the, the market, the equilibrium happens a lot faster. You know, so I still think then for the the people who want to collect and have the thrill of buying stuff kind of cheap or finding kind of cool stuff and selling it, you put an ad in the paper, man. Oh, you're Seriously. right. You're right. It, and they'll call you. People will call you. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And um, and you'll have the thrill. You know, you'll have the the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat. You might go and there might be some you find that are a honk after your two hour and a half drive. Uh, but again, that's minimized now. The older folks might have cameras and give them. You know, give them. You know, I, I've always believed that. Like, I've heard a lot of people over the years be like, "Yeah, the guy didn't know what he had, and I gave him fifty dollars." Ha ha. You know, I never really. You know, if you're gonna sell some eight hundred dollars, you know, back in our days of of um. That it where it wasn't efficient, you know, you had to go on Larry Levy's The Sheet or, mm-hmm. or, or, you know, well, yeah, if you were going to buy, you know, something that you might sell after two months for $800, well, fair value to you might be 350 you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, you know, because it's, you know, that happened a lot of times growing up or, or, you know, coming up in the vintage drums, I'd say to the person, like an older person, they'd be sitting, I'd be like, well, listen, I said, these drums you have, I said, you know, after about a month or two, you know, I might be able to get 1200 for these, but I can only give you 500 and they'd be like, well, I can't give me 1200. And I'd be like, well, it's, I'm going to have to put ads in the paper. Yeah, well, I want 1200 That's And I'd walk out without them. I'd say, well, good luck to you. You yeah. know what I mean? I mean, they, but they'd be like mad that you were going to get 1200 after all the work you were going to do and shipping and stuff. And gosh darn it, they want it right now for that price. Yeah. Um, it's a business. I, I mean, that's, that's how businesses work, obviously. And you kind of got to treat it like that, but, but be fair. Um, and I just think, too, you said before that I think is worth re-mentioning is 
on certain situations, the post office can be much cheaper. On certain other situations, FedEx and UPS can. But there's something where if it's, like you said, smaller, like I think for me to mail a T-shirt, uh, which I'm now out of, at some point I'll restock and, and I owe you a T-shirt, Terry. But nice. it, it is way more expensive. It would be $5 to ship a, a shirt through the post office. It might be yeah. $20 on FedEx or something. Well, well, that well, that's the thing. And here's the thing, a tip for USPS, for the post office. The threshold is 15.9 ounces, one pound. Hmm. So, like, I, I have these drumsticks I make, right? I have the Bonzolium 2A, the 2B, and then now I have the 5A, which is, like, the 2A model. I've been, you know, Bonham really loved the 2As. Hmm. And back in way back in the day, sticks before heavy metal and rock and stuff, sticks were a little more delicate in the sense that toward the top, the the show, like, the, the, the just under the bead sometimes would be, it would be like a girdle. Like a like an hourglass kind of, and you yeah. get a really good rebound. But you know, if you start playing heavy music, you know those sticks would break real fast if you don't have the technique to play with them. So they got, you know, that's why starting in like the seventies into the eighties, suddenly the area below the bead got a lot thicker, and it just kind of would would um, it'd be like a st- there wouldn't be any taper in there. It would just be beefier. Um, but I have these sticks that I sell. Well, if you sell one pair of sticks or one T-shirt, it comes in under a pound. So yeah. your your shipping might be five dollars. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. But if, as soon as you cross that threshold, it almost your price your your shipping almost doubles. Yeah, you know what I mean. Um, so if I send two shirts, it costs nine dollars to ship it because it's got to go priority. Yeah, if I sell one shirt or one sticks, you can sell it first class, um, and it's you know whatever four or five dollars or. Yeah. So, but just, you know, that's the thing to remember. It's just that threshold, this with the one pound threshold, at the post office. But what I do, if, like for the stuff I've been selling, I get five by five by five boxes from Uline. You know what I mean? I yep. might buy 50 of them for, I don't know, 40 bucks. You know, the shipping is kind of unreasonable, but, you know, they come, you know, and I just throw a part in there and you send it off, you know, and, and uh, I use the post office for that, you know, but yeah. Yeah. I would recommend for one t shirt if you're going to, you know, use the post office. And sometimes you still use the post office if it's, if it's just over. But, you know, there are sometimes if you have a Tom Tom, a 12 inch Tom in a box, you go to the post office, priority to send it to California is going to be $42. Mm-hmm. You know, you go to FedEx, it might be 28. UPS exactly. might be 22, or, or you switch those around. The, you know, see, so but you just get used to it um, you yeah. know, from doing it a lot. You yeah. know what I mean? It's essentially small stuff with the post office and bigger stuff use UPS or FedEx and eBay makes it real easy now on the shipping page. You can you can you can shop for the best price right after you sell it. It shows you the different options of what each carrier has for the box you have, and that's that's great. That's a really convenient. They didn't used to do that. Yeah, because it's not um, it's not easy to know this, and it takes experience. And I'm glad we're talking about stuff like that because I think that's pretty practical. Uh, it's not all, you know, reading your the newspaper and hunting and going and finding. There's technical stuff of like, OK, I'm going to sell these parts. Um, yeah. Is it more efficient to put it in an envelope versus a box? You know, <laughs> like there's little. Well, 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 that's what gets hard, too. Like, I've had a couple people get all, you know, they're bent out of shape. They're like, hey, man, you know, you can just throw that in an envelope for 50 cents and they have the power to give you a negative. They bought sure. it and they're renegotiating when somebody buys your thing. And you say shit buyer will pay four dollars. They legal they have to pay they're agreeing to that when yeah. they buy it. But I mean you you eBay won't enforce it. You're gonna have some guy like if you don't send that to me for sixty cents, I'm gonna give you a negative. And that really stinks. So they kind of got you by the short hairs. Yeah. So but then the problem is you can't ship it for fifty cents because it won't be any tracking with it. Yeah. So the guy can even get it if he's an arsehole, he can get it and say he didn't got it and you refund his money. So, you know, that's why you gotta do the uh you know, the at least the first class mailing, which all day long is at least three fifty. Yeah. And that's just the way it goes, you know, and you just there's been a time or two where I have thrown it. Actually, what I did with these people is I shipped it the way I normally did. It cost me five dollars, but I charged them 60 cents. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, sure. A couple of these, and it's just it's just even though you're losing four dollars in the sale, you're just not going to have some crybaby, you know, who, <laughs> you know, really thinks that, you know, hey, man, just wrap it up and put it in a little envelope. And, you know, yeah. I mean, if he's my buddy, I, okay, if that's how you want it, you know, he's not going to, if it doesn't come, you know, Billy, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. But if they're an eBay buyer, they got, they can, they can zap you with negative, which you know, hurts it's, it's you, just, which, which does really oh, hurt. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's just a pay, you know, you get people like that. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people that 
You can have a good price on a drum. I noticed this. And I've had some people say, hey, you know, I'd buy that. But, you know, you want $11 shipping. It should only be 6 And I'm like, so you're not going to buy it, even though it's a great deal on the drum itself. You're saving $40. I'm selling it for $40 cheaper, $80 cheaper than this other person is. But you're not going to buy it out of principle because I'm charging $4 <laughs> more shipping yeah. than you think is fair in your mind. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and I think you like people like that. Like you said, Amazon, I'm guilty of it. We're all guilty of it. Like you see something that's like uh on a you know, uh, a retail website, whatever it is, like you're buying a coat or something, and it's like, yeah, I have to pay for shipping. It kind of like catches you now because you're like I'm so used to like Amazon Prime or whatever, but yeah, right, it, right. it is what it is. Um but, but it is, but you know, there's a you know, there's a great drum. I'll tell you right now, something timely. On eBay, there's a seller, there's a twelve by seventeen Ludwig red sparkle tenor drum Hmm. and i'll tell you those tenor drums that size 12 by 15 so 15 diameter 12 inch deep uh and the larger ones honest to god they're 17 inch uh diameter remo will make you a head to 17 if you order it uh they're they're just that proportionality those are in fact that's what you saw before remember how you were you said you could see the vintage drums back there the red or silver sparkle well the floor times i have for that you know the quote floor times are both 12 by 15 and 12 by 17 that i put legs on oh cool um but there's a seller on there that has a 12 by 15 i'm sorry 12 by 17 inch red sparkle ludwig that you know they were asking a lot of money for and slowly they've lowered the price and shipping was like sixty dollars but they're they're just like i don't know they're in ohio or something i'm in chicago you know shipping should be like you know maybe 28 or 30 yeah. you know but they wanted like this sixty dollars to ship it so i just asked him i said is there any way you could you know look, you know i'm a little cl- you know i could maybe bring the shipping down to 40 and then when they relisted the drum the drum they raised the price 10 or 20 dollars and they raised the shipping 10 or 20 dollars just to like stick it to me you know i just Man. because they were mad you know i wasn't asking for them to ship the drum for 10 dollars. i just thought you know from my experience shipping drums yeah they were overcharging by 40 percent, and i just thought maybe they were just maybe a little ignorant but no they knew darn well they're looking to make a little extra money on shipping you know, and how dare you ask them if they can go a little cheaper no you know? and and that that actually not to make this episode you know m- 50 percent about shipping but like i do want to say that like there's like that ethical dilemma that you kind of think of like that just might be some backdoor way to make more money which you got to watch out for because if if shipping is a hundred bucks on something and it should be 20 i guess that is kind of a slimy way for people to um, well well the fact of the matter is is when you pull the trigger on the buying you're agreeing to that do you yeah, know what i mean yeah like i might see a snare drum i'm like you know like this happened this happened not that long ago there was a um what did i buy um, I forget what it was. I think it was a five by 14, 1971 superphonic. It was like, I don't know. It was like two fifty, but shipping was $70 or $60. But I bought it anyway, because my net, I still, even with that, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't buy it and then email the person and say, listen, I'm just giving you 25 to, sh-, you know, <laughs> yeah. you, 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 I've had that happen to me. Yeah. Like I just talked about. Um, but again, you know, when you buy something, you know, you're paying what, you know, if you bought a drum for $300 and shipping was 60, you paid 360 for it. You didn't pay $300 for it. Yeah. So you just look at what the total is. I mean, shouldn't you factor it in as part of your cost or yeah. part of what you're selling? Um, yeah. But yeah, shipping is a big deal, especially in these days, because everybody just ships now, you know, so you should, you know, get the ins and outs of, you know, it, again, it is great with eBay. They make it real easy where they'll have all these options of how, you know, different carriers, how you want to ship it. And you can shop yeah. for the cheapest thing, you know, and it's nice, you know. Yeah. Um, but then again, there's some people who might have a drum there, you know, and and, and but they don't, you know, how they're going to ship it is, well, I'm going to take this to the UPS store. The UPS is going to box it up for me. Which is and, crazy you know, and maybe, expensive. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that, but I know that this person or this, sometimes these people who are selling it, they're, they're charging that kind of price as if they're going to have UPS or FedEx box it up for them. But, you know, they're not. No. You know what I mean? They, you know, they've been selling long enough. They're going to do it themselves. Yeah. Um, but again, yeah. that's the, honestly, though, that's their prerogative. You know, some people will have more of a competitive price on the actual price you're going to pay, you know, stri- your, your nom- nominal price you're going to pay on Reverb or eBay. But then, you know, you're agreeing to whatever price they're laying out in front. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. of you but then sometimes what does happen is they might say well we'll work out shipping after so then you buy it and suddenly they're like all right it's 100 to ship and you're like wait a minute yeah that's you know i know it's not you know yeah so no but, those are yeah shipping is a big part of of the of the vintage drum collecting or of anything you know yeah all all good points for people to know um 
Would you say collecting and actually holding your having your hands on a specific drum is really the best way to learn about all these parts and pieces and models and, you know, different serial number stuff, as opposed to maybe just looking on, you know, Google, which is great too, just just studying old catalogs. But to well, me, it seems like I, holding I, it is, is just. No, well, yeah. well, that's that's a big thing. I mean, um, you, you know, especially like I like you. It's funny that you mentioned those, um, uh, you know, those premieres, um, you know, back whatever, 10 years ago. Yeah. A lot of the drums that I had amassed, at least at this location where I live in this house now, weren't vintage. I um, I used to wait till there were deals on kits. Again, Amazon and Music 1, 2, 3, especially with the Sonar stuff. They used to have the 3001, 2001, and then they changed it to the 2003, 3003, the force and they changed it to 3005 2005 1005 and then 2007 the year 2007 they'd update it again they made it the you know 1007 the 2007 the 3007 but when though when those drums when they'd re when they would bump it up to the five or the seven they would give away though the other kids mm. right buy them yeah just you know partially you know, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm obsessive compulsive and I'm a little bit of a hoarder. I knew I wasn't going to lose money on it. And when something would come through, I would learn, you know, firsthand what the quality was, um, you know, versus people just talking about it, sure. you know? Um, you know, I remember a lot of times people like, oh, you know, don't get that, you know, that Tom, uh, the reissue superstar, because they kind of, and I'm like, well, the I bought a couple and I looked at them and I got a chance to sort of feel them, smell them and touch them. I'm really familiar with the build, you know, yeah. it's nice to have that experience firsthand. Um, you know, but your motives for doing it are you want that experience, but also too you're not going to lose money. You know, I'm not going to I, that ex, that 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 experience isn't worth me losing money on it. No. But if I can at least just break even, and you are kind of losing money because sometimes you're breaking even breaking even nominally, but you also have it at the house and you got to box it up. Yeah. But that's something also to the love of drums. It's kind of cool doing yeah. that to a degree. But you know, you do have to be wary online. Because even still to this day, even on the Ludwig site, there there were there was a, a the serial number um, pages and 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 records that they have. Nobody is still updated it even here in 2022. Mm. You know, you'll still see on these sites that a serial number of like you know like nine ninety or nine hundred ninety thousand or one million on the Ludwig site is nineteen seventy six. Like it's like they they jump. You know, they say this one and this one is 64, 65. This one to this one is 68 or 67. And then this one, you know, 760 uh, XXX is 69. But then they and then they have 1970 um, unserialed, you know. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, th and then but then it like jumps to 1976. I mean, I can't tell you how many five by 14 Ludwig Superphonics I got that were from like 1970, 71, because people looked and they looked on the on the website on Ludwig site even and some of these other sites where you know if it was uh, a nine eighty eight or whatever they thought it was from 1976, you know. Mm. Um, so nobody still to this day has really has corrected this in misinformation that's out there you know yeah um there's a fella i know on one of the drum forums in fact it's called drumform.org oh yeah uh a nice guy i can't think of his name but k casey D dad you know there are there are some people that are really trying to nail down these serial numbers um you know but still though i mean you know there's still you know just not accurate information out there you know yeah um yeah, but putting but, your you hands know, on them, like you said, and actually holding them, I just think that that um, it's the best experience if you can do it. You yeah, know? and I think of just people I've met at the drum shows and and things like that, where you think to yourself, like you know, this twenty five year old guy or girl or whatever, it's like, how do you have so much knowledge about these this these vintage drums? But it's like, again, if you if you hold it and you look at it and you're studying it, it's just it's easier to retain than. Um, just read for me reading about it briefly and then doing an episode talking about it. And maybe that's part of my problem is, you know, doing all these interviews, the, the earlier stuff gets smashed out of my brain because I can't, uh, I'm out of room or something, but. Oh yeah, no, no, I know what you mean, yeah. but no, but that's the thing. I mean, it, it was really, um, you know, it, it is great. You know, when you learn firsthand, you know, stuff, you know, you see yourself and you know, the quality of stuff. And then there's some stuff you'll see some people that have been collecting a long time. And sometimes like, for example, you, not that long ago, maybe nine years ago, you know, Ludwig um, at, at some point, like 69, 70, 71, 
um, sold some brass shell superphonics, five by fourteens, and you know they what they do is they put a B above the tone control on the shell. You'd see a B stamped in, and the uh, the bad the shells were like uh, drilled for like a '60s Keystone, but you'd see a blue and olive badge on there. But there, but the area where the serial number would be would be clipped off. Hmm. So those drums, you know, mo- Ludwig collectors are they're familiar with those. You see them on eBay. And it wasn't that long ago. You still see people like Ludwig made 200 of these. And you're like, wait a minute. The past five years, I've seen 200 of these show up on freaking eBay, you know, <laughs> and growing up, you know, in the 90s, I used to see these drums. Yeah. But I didn't know they were brass because I never, you know, sure. they were plated nicely, but no one, you know, the, the market was, in, you know, inefficient. You know, you really didn't see until somebody pointed out to me like, oh, that could be brass. And there are drums from that era, which do have from, you know, they, they look just like it. They have the clip badge, but they're not brass. They're you, they're they're alloy, you know. They're lead alloy, which is aluminum, an aluminum alloy. Yeah. But nobody really knew. I mean, maybe some collectors did. I'd never seen anybody talk about it uh, on the internet. But that they also made nine, uh, six and a half by fourteen brass shells as well. But what they did was, is the the B wasn't stamped above the tone control. It was stamped behind the butt plate. Mm. And my friend Bob Marzalak is a fellow I know over the years from collecting. He's a symbol guru. He knows so much about Paiste and Zildjian and stuff because he's gotten his hands on him himself. You know, he was, you know, like me, very obsessive, compulsive. He has had so many original giant beats and 602s and old Zildjians go through his hands, um, you know, because he's, you know, a, 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 you know, like an obsessive compulsive or buy or sell or, you know, not to make money just because he really wanted to see the stuff firsthand. Yeah, exactly. But he got in a trade. He had something that he sold. I can't remember what it was. It might have been like an 18 inch thermogloss Ludwig bass drum. And he got in trade a six and a half by 14 brass snare. And I remember he told me, he's like, well, Terry, you know, I got this brass snare. And I'm like, oh, Bob, thinking to myself in my head, I'm like, Bob, you got ripped off. Mm. You know, bring it on over. We'll take a look at it. So sure enough, he brought it over and the plating was exquisite. You know, you know, aluminum doesn't like to be plated. Aluminum is a very react. You know, when you, you know, when you plate stuff, what you do is you put a, you know, typically what they do is they put a copper plate on, then a nickel plate and then a chrome plate, kind of like a three step process. Um, but when you put that copper plate over aluminum copper and aluminum fight with each other they don't like it you know what i mean yeah so but if you have a brass shell drum well guess what brass is brass is copper and zinc that's what brass is so it'll take plating better you know in those days a lot of places used brass or something with copper in it because it would plate better the the plating quality was good not necessarily the the sonorific or the sound of brass just really brass was a material that would plate very nicely because it's copper so anyway <laughs> long story short so i realized i was looking at the drum i'm like well this this boy this really does look you know the funny thing is chrome plated brass especially with the ludwig superphonics when you look at the chrome on the shell it almost looks like you ever seen liquid mercury before yeah silver it, yep. it almost has that kind of uh of uh of a rich sort of look to it versus, sure. you know, when you look, when you see a chrome over aluminum shell, even if it's plated wonderfully, if you look real cro- close at the chrome, you're going to see almost very slight lines that go from left to right from when the shell was buffed. Hmm. Even if it's plated, you know, but when you look at a, a superphonic and you don't see any of those little teeny lines at all, it looks like has that mercury look. You should really check and see if it's brass, you know, take a lug off, scratch a little more than you otherwise might. Because you yeah, might on yeah. a, an aluminum shell, you might just scratch through the chrome plating and the nickel plate and just hit the copper plate. You know, sometimes people, you know, on those superphonics, sometimes the the chrome and the nickel will flake off and then make it look like it's brass. But what you're looking at is just the copper plate. But so we did, and, and you know, I we scratched a little off. I'm like, wow, Bob, sure enough, this is a, a, a brass shell. And I just looked all over, and I'm like, and I found the B under the butt plate. So some years later, which is now maybe a year or two ago, maybe just before the pandemic, I was on the internet or on YouTube. I'm sorry. I will often in my videos interchange eBay and YouTube <laughs> because I'm a skull. I'm 52. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, sometimes you can find these drums on e- on YouTube. Yeah. But other times I made a video on eBay. Anyway. Yeah. Um, but I saw a seller was selling one and I could just tell by looking at it, it was brass. You know, the serial number 
The serial number on these six and a halves that I've seen are all in the 700 range, like right after they went from the Keystone badge to a blue and olive badge. And on the six and a halves, the badges aren't clipped. The serial number is on there and they're all in like the 750 range. Okay. So this is a good bit of advice for people. If you see a Ludwig Superphonic that is a blue and olive badge in the set at all in the 700s, probably in the 800s too, although I've never seen a six and a half, um, look at that plating and look under the butt plate. Anyway, I saw one on there. I could tell right away that it, I'm like, that has got to be brass. I emailed the seller and I asked him, I said, hey, is there a B under the butt plate? And he said, yeah. I'm like, well, that's a brass drum. He's like, well, I really don't think it is. I'm like, no, it is. He's like, no, I don't think so. So I, I didn't have the $500 at the time, the 600. So I called up George, my friend, George Flutus, who you did the interview yep. of. He's got Bonhamology and he plays with the people's front of Zeppelin guys. And I said, George, if you got 600 bucks, dude, buy this drum. And he did. <laughs> so now my friend Peisty Bob that you see in these videos that I've had Peisty Bob and George are the only two people I know in the whole wide world that have a six and a half by four train comb over brass be stamped under the butt plate drum. Wow. So uh, my advice to people, you know, yes, they have the clipped badge, you know, 1970 you know, ish superphonics with the B above the butt plate while they're there are also six and a halves. Hmm. Um, and there are also two, uh, a later 1968 brass drum that I bought on eBay um, that has crimp snare beds um, that I thought, you know, and, and a couple of years ago, a fella sold like uh, pretty much almost the exact same drum. His story was that that fella from pro, what is it? Pro drums in LA. I forget the guy's name ordered a bunch from Ludwig. So there are some late sixties chrome over brass, which are rare. Those are more rare than the B stamped over the uh, tone control hmm. uh, clip badge. They're more rare than that, but they're out there too. And those are all in the, in the serial number range of um, like six sixty six seventy. Again, if you see a Ludwig Superphonic, just you can start by looking at the plating, and if it looks murky, like 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 really nice plating, examine it. Whether it whether it doesn't have a serial number and a red, you know, you know the old you know Super Ludwig's that had the heavy cast lugs and the chrome over brass, you know hoops anyway i don't want to talk too much about that no, but I, I do think if you're a ludwig collector uh the the, the field uh what, what is a ripe area to start looking into which is fun uh look for those six and a half by 14 brass drums with the b behind the butt plate and also look for those late 60s um that have the their brass and they have crimp snare beds just like the later versions the, the snare bed looks a lot like the uh snare bed after ludwig stopped making brass chrome over brass super ludwigs in like 66 61 62 or whatever they made they they went to the ludaloy shell which was aluminum but they still didn't use the acoustic perfect snare snare bed they still use the crimp snare bed well the crimp snare beds you see on those aluminums you know that that, ha that don't have serial numbers it looks like the exact same uh, crimp snare bed you'll see on these uh, late 60s brass ones. So keep your eyes peeled for those. I think that's really exciting. I have yeah. from time to time look on eBay to see if I can find those. It's just a lot of fun. I mean, that's it's a nice it's a hunt. Yeah, and that's the the hunt is exactly right. And I, I the reason I wanted to have you on for this particular episode, which I want to do more kind of collector talks with people, is... I need I personally want to learn more. Obviously, I learn a lot about the history of the drums in general from doing these episodes, but I want to learn more about um, just collecting because I need to start to uh, um, just build up my collection. I've done it a lot over the years, but I've, again, I don't I'm not as I don't know. I need to get my hands on more things um, and and learn. But I think the, the reason, again, I wanted to have you is because you've got all this experience and I know some people are listening saying you've got Terry Keating on Bonzolium. Why are you not talking about Bonham? And I want to just say that. Um, so like you mentioned, George Flutus did an awesome Bonham episode on my show. But I want to give a shout out to um, Ben Hilsinger over at the Big Fat Five um, podcast. You yeah, he's were on a great guy. He's his great show guy. and did an amazing Bonzo episode. And Ben and I are on the drum click, which is the same network. So I was just kind of like, you know. If you want to go check out that uh, Terry's episode, just hear him talk about Bonham on there and uh, yeah, give big fat snare drum. Yeah, exactly. Which Ben is awesome, and um, that episode turned out great. And uh, I wanted to see the the other side of Terry, which is again the collecting. And I think people have probably learned on this episode that you really do know your stuff. But that being said, you're you know people know you as Bonzolium and all that good stuff. 
Do you want to maybe kind of as we wrap up, talk a little bit about what people can expect? Is there any cool bonz Bonzo stuff that that you're learning or what we can expect well, on YouTube and, and all again, that stuff? Ju just like I talk about, you know, those brass six and a half by 14s with the blue olive badge. And I talk about those late 60s um, crimp badge brass ones, which supposedly there's some six and a half of those, too. Um, although, you know, finding a six and a half by 14 superphonic with the Keystone badge, whether it's brass or not, is those are hard to find. Um, you know, I, I would say, you know, what I the big thing is for me, like the uncharted territory that I really want to get with Bonham is kind of really what happened to his gear. Yeah, sure. And, um, you know, and I, I had a video for a long time that I posted on YouTube on my channel. Uh, the video was sent to me on a VHS format by a fella named Bill Townsend, who lived down in, uh, I think, South Carolina or North Carolina. And he sent it to me, and he purportedly at the time, a lot of people, he said, and a lot of people thought that he had the original uh, Amber Visalite kit that John Bonham you know, played in 73 and 75 live. Um, and that's it's even in books. If you see a, a couple, you know, Led Zeppelin or John Bonham books, you'll actually see the name Bill Townsend mentioned hmm. in there. I think in in a thunder of drums that book. But I, you know, since have found out, you know, Billy Harrington has done a lot of research on. You know, he was the one that, you know, me and George and other other Zeppelinites. You know, we would just look at that thermogloss twenty six inch bass room and be like, that is that is deeper than fourteen <laughs> inches. And sure enough, they turned out to be fifteen inches deep. Yeah, because Carmine Apiece ordered it from his spec which was 15 inch deep because he had Ludwig make 15 inch deep because he had a leady bass drum that he was 15 inches deep that he really liked. But, you know, Billy and I talked, you know, there's some people have done some research in that, you know, we've determined that, you know, the, the Amber uh, kit that Bill Townsend did have in those days turned out not to be genuine. And I took the video off my channel. I left it up for a while because I just wasn't, you know, there's yeah. still some people that said it was, and but I eventually took the video down. Um, so we kind of really want to see kind of what happened to all that stuff, you know, the gongs and the cymbals. And, yeah. Um, and those fellas, DM 190, you know, one of the guys over there, you have Matthew and you have John. John gave some lessons to Zoe Bonham and Zoe had mentioned to him that, you know, I think a, a good part of Bonham's original stuff, you know, might have been stolen you know, um, uh, out of storage. So, but we'll get to the bottom of that. You know, John, maybe yeah. John can interview Zoe again, or Billy Harrington was going to talk to to John, you know, but we'd really love that. But one of the best sources, which would be great, would be just going right to Jason Bonham. You know, yeah. it'd be really nice to get uh, just an interview with Jason Bonham, you know, yeah. and he doesn't seem like much of a gear guy, but I do, it would just be nice if Jason would understand that to the diehard, rabid, you know, Led Zeppelin, John Bonham fans, you know, the gear, is is a big deal yeah you know totally. I mean? we'd love and to know what happened you know to all this stuff you i know? mean it but like that's what's cool about it is uh you're at 999 videos on your channel you have 60 Am almost, I? yeah you're you're almost at a thousand <laughs> one i gotta do a thousand celebration you video. should yeah and you're almost at sixty one thousand. you're close to sixty one thousand subscribers it's just nice that you and i are similar too where people go how many like for me they're like all right, you, you got to be running out of episodes. And it's like, no, there is a ton of topics. And I think you're in the same boat where you can just keep doing it and doing it. And people people are so passionate about Bonham. Um, and I also want to note that you and George and all these other Bonham uh, fanatics are really... <laughs> are, we have our Bonham altars in the basement. Exactly. Our shrines. Yes. <laughs> and I say that in a very, in a good way. And But like you guys are so like connected and really... Um, lift each other up to find stuff and uh, well, you know well we love it you know there's a passion there you know life is as hard as it is sometimes you know to have then something you love and is so interesting and is constantly engaging it makes life that just more enjoyable yeah you know what i mean there, i mean there really is I, I i really i know there's a lot of you know i, I can't I, I know I talked about the chrome over brass six and a half by 14s, you know, with the blue out bed. I mean, that's something that if I were a younger collector, I'd keep my eyes peeled oh, for. Totally. That's it's like a unicorn hunt, you know? Yes. But you'll find them. They're out there, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, you yeah. know, and, 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 and what's cool too, it's almost like when you bet on football, you love watching football games or games, but it's also nice too if San Francisco wins, you win $300. Exactly. You know what I mean? If you find one of those drums, you found it and it's really cool. But yeah, you know, you might sell that, you know, late 60s 
corn for brass with the crimp, you know, Sarah Betts for eighteen hundred dollars. You know, you might sell it and make yourself a thousand dollars on it if, yeah. if you do decide to sell it. You know, so but yeah, it's just passion. It's just something that just I just love the drums. You know, I just you know love Zepp and other bands too. I'm a huge Police fan. I love the Who. Totally. You know, I love Genesis. You know, Phil Collins was a total badass back in the day and you know copeland is still a living legend alive you know copeland i always say he himself you know i bonds oleum somebody could have moon oleum or <laughs> yeah. whatever but copeland himself is copeland oleum you know i still yeah. think he should sit down and go over the songs you know he could make 80 videos his place is all wired up for sound and everything yeah, exactly. video he could just do it behind, you know, like when you see the behind the boards, he could bring up the drums only or talk about this or that. Yeah. You know, Tama and Peist, he would sponsor it. You know, he'd, I've been recommending that to him for 10 years, you know? Yeah. So it'd be nice if he does it at some point, you know? Yeah. Well, that's a good segue because uh, it's, it sounds easier than it is. Um, but again, for someone like you who's got a thousand videos out and it's clearly paying off. Um, which I should say as well, it's B O N Z O L E U M Bonzolium. If anyone hasn't heard of it, uh, check it out on YouTube, but, um, it, it, it is not super, I mean, obviously Stuart Copeland is wired up and could probably afford to have an engineer and videographers and stuff, but, but that <laughs> being said, step. it takes time. It takes energy for you to do what you're doing. And, um, as we're kind of finishing this episode up, I'll tell people that, um, Terry's been kind enough. He's going to hang out for a couple extra minutes once we wrap up and we're going to do, this week's bonus episode, um, kind of on some YouTube tips, which I like to do with, um, you know, if anyone is on the show who has a large following, I think it's cool to get their perspective because, you know, most of us drummers want to post videos on YouTube. We want to do things. And um, why not get some advice someone from someone who's uh, who's been doing it very well? And Terry's a phenomenal drummer and has good sound and it's funny and all that good stuff. Um, so... We will hang out and do that in just a moment. But actually, before I forget, I also want to thank there's uh, Terry. You've been actually recommended to me um, a number of times, I think, in kind of in passing. You should do You should have Terry, especially after uh, George's episode. But I, I'm looking back in my list and I have written down that um, I think his last name is Thripshaw. I believe Scott. I want to say Thripshaw uh, recommended you uh, about a year and a half ago, almost two years ago. So thanks to Scott. Um, yeah, thank you, Scott. And yeah, we've been talking for a while, too, and I'm glad we finally kind of got it together um, and made this happen. So, uh, yeah, that's that's awesome. Anywhere else you want people to find you besides the the obvious, you can you can search either Bonzolium or Terry Keating, K-E-A-T-I-N-G, anywhere else. You, you know. I, well, I do have a, a an album that I made about 10 years ago, and it's called Terry Keating Greatest Hits. And um, it's songs that I totally wrote myself musically cool. and lyrically. And of course, I played the drums on it. And um, you know, one of the songs was featured on uh, – there's a station here in Chicago called WXRT, and it was played a couple times on there, which was nice. nice. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'm looking to record – I, I actually I put on one of my videos, I'd like to record two albums this year. Um, I have one that's actually almost recorded. I just don't have any lyrics on, and then I'd like to do another one from the ground up as well. Um, cool. you know, I, and I do have played, I used to be in a band called leave L E A V E and those CDs are out there. And I used to be in a band called Satya Graha years ago. We made uh, a couple records and on our own, you know, we weren't on a label or anything. Yep. Um, and as of late, I've been playing with a fellow named Ty Vare. Um, you know, and he is, has been singing with the people's front of Zeppelin, the PFOZ people, but yeah. you know, Ty really loves the sound I have down here and he loves my playing. So he was nice enough to contract me out to play drums on his stuff. Cool. You know, we just released a video. There's a new song called, um, ships, you know, like ships on the ocean. Yeah. And, um, you know, that, that is really more like my normal way of playing the drums, how I normally play in my head or how I, is, is kind of the ships is there's like 11 or 12 songs that I played on them that I've, you know, you can find on like Spotify and stuff and on YouTube. But that last one is really kind of more how I, I, I really actually play the drums. That's you know awesome. what I mean? Like my, more yeah. of my personality in it, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, you're, you're very, um, I will say you're, you sometimes people hate the term, but you yourself are a content creator. And I think people don't like it because it kind of diminishes it of like, what the hell is content? You make you make great, <laughs> great things. But I say that because you really put out a lot of stuff and you're always working. And um, and that's what I think people really appreciate is when something is consistent and it's always in your cool, you know, drum drum room basement. And it, like I said, it has good sound, good sense of humor. Um, and I love putting them on 
Um, I work at night a lot and I just have the TV going and I edit video and audio stuff. And I I've very frequently put up your videos just because they can kind of like they're fun to watch kind of in the background for me while I'm doing that. So, um, well, I appreciate it, Bart. That's yeah. really cool. It's, um, I just love doing it. I just really love drums. I love when people uh, I'm with or like drums as much as I do. It's nice when somebody sends a comment on the page or sends me an email and says, you know, I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, I used to I used to think, you know, Copeland did play that snare. You know, it's just, yeah. you know, there's a lot more drum geeks out there than than you think there are, definitely, you know, and definitely. everybody's especially with, you know, like, you know, certain drummers, you know, your key, your, your Stuart Copeland's or your John Bonham's or your, you know, so it's, um, it's, it's really just rewarding. It's exciting. You know, I could, I could sit and I could talk forever about drums and about this or that. And just yeah. cause it's interesting and it just makes me feel good and the whole, and it seems to make other people feel good too. So that makes me, yeah. that makes me feel good as well. And yeah. it makes other people, it's, you know what totally. I mean? it's our community so. and, and it's, that's who's listening to this. And, um, uh, you know, I'd be surprised if people hadn't heard of you, but for in some, you know, way that if they're finding out just now for the first time, you got to go over and check out, um, terry's youtube channel bonzolium um but on that note terry why don't we hop over and we'll record the little bonus episode but uh um, i'd like to thank somebody bart sure. um you know of course ty Vare for you know playing on his stuff he's a great guy but i actually was um i didn't realize it i was featured in modern drummer just this last year yeah uh, i think congrats. in the june issue and that's because of clementine moss she plays in um a zeppelin tribute band um god i can't think of the name of it um you know, there's a bunch of uh, of bands. Um, Zepparella, that's what it is. You cool. ever heard of Zepparella? No, that's awesome though. Yeah, Clem Moss, God love her. She she interviewed me, and it was going to go on some site or something somewhere, but somehow you know she's a the, the fellow who she was going to publish it with is like, oh, you know, I work for Modern Drummer. Let's put it in Modern Drummer. <laughs> so I had an actual you know three or four page feature in modern drummer this past the june 2021 issue that's awesome and i just i really appreciate that i feel very honored and i just really want to thank clem you know for for, for being kind enough to interview me yeah i mean that's like bucket list type stuff getting featured in modern drummer for what you're doing in your basement uh with youtube you know what i mean like that's it's i, I it's crazy. was and i didn't realize it i didn't know i kept waiting for her to email me and tell me it was going to be on some you know podcast and somebody <laughs> somebody text me like hey man great modern drummer interview i'm like i was like what are you talking about <laughs> yeah that's that's huge i mean that's just i mean it, it was really it was very flattering and, and i'm very grateful very grateful to have that honor of being in a magazine like that's that. great yeah nothing nothing beats that um Cool. All right, Terry. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I'm sure everyone's enjoyed it. And thank you for everyone uh, for listening. And again, if you want to hear the Patreon bonus episode with Terry, where he's going to teach me to uh, be a successful YouTuber um, like himself, <laughs> go to drumhistorypodcast.com and there's a Patreon link and you can um, click that. And for as low as two bucks a month, get all these bonus episodes with um, great guests like Terry. So Terry, thank you for being here. Thank you, Bart. I really, really appreciate you having me on. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.